For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jill House, and I'm going to be lecturing today and tomorrow on what I've called aspects of discourse intonation. Those of you who've been before will have heard this before as well, but uh, I hope you'll bear with me if I go through it again. When I talk about discourse intonation, I mean the way we actually use spoken language in our interactions with each other. What you've learnt so far, I think, is you've learnt to, uh, a number of tools for analysing intonation. You've learnt a lot of terminology. You've learnt about the nucleus and about nuclear tones and so forth. And you've learnt how to analyse what's going on within a word group. Um, today I shall be going a little bit beyond that and showing how we use these tones um, in practice and how we use intonation to shape the discourse that we're conducting with the person that we're, we're addressing. So to begin with, um, I'm going to do a bit of recapitulation of what you, I hope, know already. We'll just revise the nuclear tones and some of the concepts that underpin the way we analyse it. I'll then start talking about pitch as a discourse organiser. That's the actual, um, when I say pitch, I mean, you, you know, the correlative fundamental frequency of what we hear as either high or low pitch and how we use that. Then I'm going to do a little bit about question intonation. Because questions are actually a very important part of our interaction in discourse. Mm -hmm. And we have all sorts of different types of questions. Um, and it's quite interesting to analyse the typical ways of asking those questions. And perhaps what the implications might be if we do it in a slightly different way. At the back of your handout, there's a practice dialogue, which um, I don't suppose we will have time to get through during this session, but you can take them to your um, tutorial, your backup classes afterwards, and work through those if it's useful. It's full of questions, so it's quite fun to work through. Can everybody hear me, by the way? Good. If the microphone gives up in the middle, I have got a spare battery, but um, <laughs> we'll see, see what happens. Okay. The story so far. What we do and why we do it, calling this in terms of intonation. When we speak, we divide our speech into chunks, what we call intonational phrases or word groups or intonation groups. Okay. I think the current terminology for most of the handouts this year is intonation phrases. If I occasionally use intonation group or word group, bear with me, they all mean exactly the same thing. I call them IPs on your handout, please. So why do we divide our speech into chunks? Well, it helps the listener. Um, it shows the listener which pieces of information belong together. An awful lot of what we do in intonational terms is to help the listener. Um, we want to smooth the interaction, we want to make it easy for the other person to process what we hear, to understand what we mean, so we will exploit what we can of intonation to help the listener. Something else we have to bear in mind, and this is something to do with English particularly, uh, that English speech, uh, most varieties of English at any rate, is a mixture of stressed and unstressed syllables. And that's just a fundamental fact about the rhythm of English. And so all the sort of intonation um, analyses that we've been using are based on this fact that we have a mixture of stressed and unstressed syllables. And we've also learnt that some stressed syllables are more stressed than others, if you like. They're more important than others. They're made prominent by pitch, and those are the ones that we call accented syllables. Probably most of our um, stresses, most of our stressed syllables are in fact accents. Most of them have a little bit of a boost in pitch. 
Um, but we can exploit the accented syllables to highlight the most important pieces of information in the intonation group, in the IP. Right? So the foreground pieces of information. If you think about our intonation phrases, they're usually a mixture of something that's in the foreground, something that's in the background. And we highlight the things in the foreground by putting accents on them. Now, you've also learnt that the last accent in any intonation phrase is the nucleus. And the nucleus is strongly associated with the main focus of attention in that intonation phrase. And the last accent in the intonation phrase, this nucleus, is also the place where the pitch pattern called the nuclear tone is going to be initiated. It will always start on that syllable. The nuclear tone tells us a great deal about the status of the intonation group. It's not just the speaker's attitude, but also in relation to the status of that group in relation to other intonation groups or in relation to the other speaker. It might be um, to do with our interaction with another speaker in terms of turn taking. So our intonation will help give, give each other cues as to where it's okay to butt in and where we should wait because the first person hasn't finished speaking yet. So. Okay. Uh, and another thing that it's worth bearing in mind, and this is quite important uh, for discourse organisation, at any point while we're speaking, we will be using either a relatively wide or relatively narrow pitch range. Okay. And we do make use of the, um, the width of the range that we, that we use as we speak. Uh, we sort of go around thinking, oh yes, well, the speakers are generally using a range of around an octave or perhaps a bit more. Um, but when you actually look at it, when you analyse it, you find that they're using a wide range in certain positions and really quite a narrow range in other positions. And that's sometimes called key. Um, the, the, the pitch span or the range, key, is another word that's used for that. And it does have an organising function. For example, if I switch to a high key, it can signal a new topic or something unexpected. I mean, if I behave myself giving this lecture, whenever I turn to a new topic, I should start on a higher pitch than usual, so you better monitor, monitor me and see if I actually do that, do what I say I'm going to do. When you get towards the end of talking about a topic, you tend to use a much narrower pitch range. You've still got all that movement within the top and the bottom of the range, but it tends to be narrower together. Another thing to remember is that when we differentiate between high falls and low falls, or between high rises and low rises, another way of looking at that is to say, well, maybe it's a switch of key of the pitch range that we're using, but at a, in a very local context. So, um, dealing with a particular word or a particular syllable inside an intonation phrase. Um, that's changing key um, at a local level, perhaps. Whereas when we talk about the whole speech, we're talking about key at a global level, the whole of the discourse. Okay. Let's just revise these nuclear tones. Um, these are the ones I expect that you've become familiar with. We start with two falling tones, and I've used as the carrier the, um, just the interactive discourse, hmm, the sort of thing that you use over the phone a lot to tell people that you're actually there. Um, and we can say an awful lot with hmm. Uh, we can use any intonation pattern, any nuclear tone we like on it, um, and it will convey something to the listener about our own attitude towards that point in the discourse. So let's practice them all on... Mm. Mm. Let's start with the high fall 
So you're going to start high and fall. Hmm. Good. Sounds pretty enthusiastic, doesn't it? Um, now let's try the low fall. Must be. The low fall. Hmm. Right. The difference there being that we start at a lower point in our own in our overall pitch range and then fall to the baseline. Both the high fall and the low fall fall to the baseline, um, but the high fall is using high key because it's using a complete range. Low fall is simply using low key because it's using um, a very limited amount of the available pitch range. The fall rise, um, here we are, the fall rise here. Now this one tends to use quite a wide range, so we tend to use it in high key. Uh, we start somewhere in the middle, we go up and then down again. Mm. Mm. Good. Good. Um, what, do, what do people associate that particular tone with? Impressed. Mm. I'm very impressed. Yes, yeah, sounding impressed. I think that's, um, you know, it could be a negative or positive, but you're going to be sounding impressed. Now, how about this one? This is the high rise. It's starting relatively high in your pitch range and going even higher. Mm? 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 Good. And that's probably in a high key because it's using the top part of the pitch range. The low rise starts at the bottom of your pitch range. Um, it will be low key if it only rises halfway up. It will be high key if it goes right up to the top. So let's try both versions. Let's do a, a narrow version of the low rise. Mm. 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 And now let's do a full rise all the way up. Mm. 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 Right, <laughs> okay, yes. So you're going to be you know, really quite animated if you use that full rise there. Then the full rise... Um, a very important tone in English because we seem to use it a lot. It requires two pitch movements. It requires you to start high, go down, up again. Mm. 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 Good, you've all been practicing that one, I can see. It's good. And then finally, there's the mid-level tone. Um, I don't know whether you've been given that tone mark before, it's all a straight line or what, this one, right. Um, it just simply means a bit, a bit of pitch suspension. Mm. Mm. Yeah, sounds a bit routine, perhaps sounds a bit bored, all sorts of things like that. Um, but it's actually quite common. Okay, good. So let's think about pitch as a discourse organiser. We'll start off with something extremely simple, but it's actually works in a, uh, a surprising number of cases. Falling tones, whether they're high, low, or rise fall, can be used to signal completeness. It can mean, I've come to the end of what I'm going to say, it could mean simply that that's all I've thought of so far. Um, I, I'm not signalling any kind of continuity I use it for. But using a rising tone, whether that's a high rise, a low rise, or a full rise, or indeed a level tone, because level tones seem to behave in the same way as rising tones here, these often signal continuity or incompleteness. Okay. Now, they often signal other things as well. But there's something underlyingly systematic, I think, about the way falling tones behave as a class, um, as distinct from rising tones as a class. Um, to illustrate this completeness thing, my usual trick is to use a list of some sort. We're all familiar with listing intonation. When we make lists of things, we give each item in the list very often a separate intonation phrase. Um, and therefore, if it's a separate intonation phrase, it's going to have its own nuclear tone. Um, 
And then when we get to the end of a list, well, if we get a signal finality, then we will use the sort of information I'm showing here. So this says, I've got tea, or coffee, or lemonade. I'm offering you a drink. I've got tea, or coffee, or lemonade. And the first two items in the list, they're rising in pitch. Um, the end point of my pitch is higher than the baseline. That's a crucial thing to hang on to. So anything ends higher than the baseline, it can signal continuity. But when I get to the end, or lemonade, I go right down to my baseline. So that's it, folks. Nothing else on offer. But if I choose to do it a different way, for example, in uh, example two here, I've got tea, or coffee, or lemonade. I'm signaling that there may be further choices, if I can remember whether I've got any gin and tonic in the cupboard, um, or, you know, you might want to hang on in waiting for something um, slightly more tempting to come out of my list, <laughs> tea, coffee, or lemonade. Um, but what I'm signaling as a speaker is open-endedness, that I haven't closed off all the options that might be available. Now, when people are doing lists in practice, you, you, you I mean, we, we talk in lists quite often, um, you'll hear all sorts of patterns going on. It won't always be a sort of nice, well-behaved um, series of rises followed by a fall, as I've shown you there. But it sort of reflects how, the, how far the person speaking has pre-planned what they're going to say, I think. Uh, for example, I could say, oh yeah, I've got some tea, some coffee, some lemonade. I can do each one with a fall, and then each new one sounds a bit more like an afterthought, as if I hadn't actually thought ahead as to what I have in, and what I can offer you. Um, so all these things do happen. They have that slightly different feel about them, um, indicating whether there's a bit of pre-planning or not. But with these, both these versions here, you can see there is some pre-planning. You've got these rising tones, and you would expect more to follow. Same sort of thing happens when... Oh, I've got it here on an interlinear notation for you so you can actually see it. I've got tea, or coffee, or lemonade. Tea, or coffee, or lemonade. I think you're all familiar with these blobs and tadpoles and tails and things. That's how it looks. Yeah. Okay, we can also exploit the open-endedness of rises or the incompleteness of rises and the completeness of falls when we're delivering sort of stock pieces of information. For example, telephone numbers. Uh, we tend to group telephone numbers in very well-prescribed and well-understood ways. So I could say something like, my UCL number is 0207-679-3167. O two O seven six seven nine three one six seven. Okay, um, that's one way of grouping it. There is another way of grouping it as well. Do O two O seven six seven nine. If I'm a, if I'm a Londoner, we do different things. But from somebody who's outside London, this is the better way to think of it. O two O seven rise six seven nine another rise three one six seven. Got to the end. I've got the bottom there. Okay. Addresses, too, when we're giving addresses, we can indicate whether we're finished or not. It's Department of Phonetics and Linguistics, rising tone, UCL, Gower Street, four rise there, why not? That's another sort of rise. London, WC1, level tone, behaves like a rise. 6BT, get to the end, I've finished. Now, if you were copying down the address, from me, and I was said something like, Department of Phonetics and Linguistics, well I guess you would know that I hadn't finished giving you the address, even though I'd gone to the bottom there. If I then said, UCL, you might just think, well that's, that's the address, um, you know, it's made the form and got to the end. But I'd have to say, no, no, it's more to come, Gower Street, and I'd go on doing it. People do, they don't always um, use this pre-planning, rising intonation, but it is actually quite useful if you do because people then know that there's more to follow. Now notice that when I got to the end here, 
six feet tea. I got really right down to the bottom of my pitch range, um, a sort of extra low pitch. And it's that kind of extra low pitch um, that often signals to the person you're talking to that you've completed your turn. If we're talking about a conversation, um, a fall to a low pitch is often what people are subconsciously listening for. Um, so to know that it's an okay moment to jump in and say your thing without sounding as though you're interrupting. Um, it's a good idea um, to, to listen carefully to the sorts of interviews they do on radio programs. Because the interviewer, um, if he's well behaved, is listening for those cues where the interviewee falls to a low pitch, for example, um, in order to know that it's okay to butt in and ask another question. People like John Humphreys on Radio 4 don't bother waiting, they're interrupting all the time, they jump in and they often get accused of being rather impolite. Um, so he's exploiting the fact that he's a big name and he can jump in and he's supposed to be a tough interviewer, so he doesn't wait politely for people to get to the bottom. When people are doing polite interviews, Desert Island Discs or something like that, where they're not trying to interrupt, they're not trying to put the person in the spot, they will wait politely for those turn-taking cues. Um, so it's just something to be aware of when you're over listening to people in the bus stop chatting to each other. Do they do it or don't they? Okay. Another thing we can think about is the use of tone and information status. Um, we don't speak one word group at a time. We normally have several word groups, that, uh, intonation phrases, that is, that we join together. And it's interesting to see how it is that we indicate what is the most important sort of information, what's in the foreground and what's in the background. As you know, when you're dealing with one intonation phrase at a time, you can show what's foreground by accenting those, the, the relevant uh, words um, and de-accenting or putting into a nuclear tail, for example, any information that's less important. But sometimes you want to show whether one whole intonation phrase is more important than another. And you can actually use pitch to do that. Um, so, these examples here. In response to the question, what will you be doing when Skep is over? Your answer is, I'll be going to Scotland. I could stop there. You'd say, I'll be going to Scotland. Your foreground information is all there with a nice high fall on the stress symbol of Scotland. But if for some reason you want to include this piece of information in your reply, when Skep is over, you'll use something like a full rise tone to indicate that it's the background. I'll be going to Scotland when the skep is over. The foreground information is expressed with the fall and the background information with the full rise. Put the same sentence round the other way and you have an answer to a different question. So the answer in, in number six here would sound something like this. I'll be going to Scotland when Skep is over. I'll be going to Scotland, my background, when Skep is over. Now, when Skep is over, it has suddenly become foreground. And in fact, that is the answer to the question, when are you going to Scotland? Scotland is marked as background information here because it's already known, um, the two people uh, talking to each other already know that Scotland is uh, an issue. But the foreground, the new information, is when you're going to go to Scotland, and that's going to be when Skep's finished. It's the other way around in this question up here. Um, so it's a way of actually 
showing foreground and background over a much longer stretches of speech. You can use rising nuclear tones um, as background, background information, falling nuclear tones for foreground information. Um, there's quite a lot of work done by David Brazel on this. Some of you may be familiar with it in his work on discourse intonation. He calls the falling tones proclaiming tones and the full rise a referring tone, referring to information that's already shared. Okay, so that's one way. Um, but uh, yet, or yet another way in which uh, pitch can help to organise um, the discourse. <laughs> Let's think about key and information status. When we start a new topic, okay, as, as I said, uh, I'm not sure I did it very well that time, but the key and information sessions, I got it really with a real de good demonstration. We typically start on quite a high pitch when we shift to a new topic. And as we continue, the pitch gets gradually narrower in range. And the end of a topic often has that extra low pitch, the sort of um, level that we're listening for when we want to do turn-taking. Um, if you want to hear how this works with monologue, the best thing to listen to are BBC News bulletins, because they're one item of news, um, which they talk about for a bit, and then they go on to the next item of news, and they will raise the um, key in order to introduce that new um, that new topic. Um, now, this slide here um, is to do with what happens within a topic when you perhaps choose high or low key on a particular word, and what the implications of that could be. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you can think of the difference between high falls and low falls as actually a difference in key, the difference in the amount of pitch range you're using up. And in a situation where your brother has been taking driving lessons, okay, and somebody says, well, how, how's he getting on? How's he getting on with his driving lessons? You can say, oh, he took his test last week and passed. So I've done the first one. He took his test last week and passed. I'm using quite a low key there. And the fact that I use a low key there makes it sound as though that was what we expected to happen. He was doing very well. And so, good, he took his test, he passed. If, on the other hand, I say something like, he took his test last week and passed. <laughs> yes. Um, it makes it sound like much more of an unexpected thing, and you're just thinking, my God, what was the examiner doing? <laughs> um, didn't he notice he went the wrong way around the roundabout? I mean, for goodness sake, he was not ready to pass his driving test. Um, but for some reason, he passed. And that is an option that we have of exploiting the pitch range um, at a local level there, suddenly switching to a higher key to signal that something is unexpected. Um, like, second example on the... Um, Oh, right, yes, that's, that shows you the, the relationship between these accented syllables. He took his test last week and passed. So there's a kind of slope going down between the first accented syllable, first nuclear syllable there and the second one. Whereas with this one, where I'm using the high key, they're both at much the same level. He took his test last week and passed. So... The relationship between the nuclear tones there, between the two adjacent phrases, um, keeps them at the same high key. They're not going down in key. Okay, no, I'm not going to do that yet. I'm going to say, give you this other example on the handout, which I don't have on the slide, um, just to convince you, or hope to convince you, that we can use key in this way. So if I say something like in number eight, the standard was truly professional. I've used the low fall on professional. And that suggests that the standard was what we were expecting. Okay? They were professional, so good, I'm glad it was truly professional. But if we say something like, the standard was truly professional, 
It's a bit more sort of amazed, a bit more surprised, because actually there were a bunch of amateurs and they were doing jolly well. Um, that kind of implication can come over quite nicely by exploiting P. Okay, let's move on now to the questions. <coughs> lots and lots of different kinds of questions. And they usually expect a response. There is such a thing as a rhetorical question which doesn't expect a response, but most of the questions that we use in discourse, in interaction, um, are expecting response. So they're an important part of our interactive discourse. Now the rules for nucleus placement, don't forget, are exactly the same as they are in any kind of utterance. So um, statements, questions, commands, whatever, um, nucleus will be placed on the accented, uh, on the syllables which signal the most important focused information. Um, the choice of tone may be more constrained, um, but there are no absolute rules for the general sorts of questions that we ask. So please don't go away thinking, I've got to use a rising tone if I'm using a, doing a yes-no question. I've got to use a falling tone if I'm doing a WH question. Uh, there are a whole range of options available for both sorts. All we can talk about is the default norms or most likely situation, but others are always possible. So, polar questions, first of all. Questions where we expect the answer yes or no. Um, yeah, I'm going to be looking at polar questions, I'm going to be looking at alternative questions, uh, where we have to make a choice between things, and the information questions, which are the ones with our so-called WH words, who, what, when, why, and how. So, polar questions. Using a simple rise, it's a safe choice for a genuine polite question. Um, a high rise sounds more casual. Um, a full rise can sound a little bit curious. Um, a low rise, traditional, if you like. So, a traditional number nine here. Is this your first time in London? Polite, interested, engaged. Okay. Number 10, have you had a good day? A bit more casual. Do you want to try that one? Have you had a good day? Okay. That's it. Uh, what about number 9? Is this your first time in London? That's it, good. And number 11, the one that I said could make it sound a little bit more curious. Do you like phonetics? <laughs> Yes, yeah, sorry. Slight implication of gosh. <laughs> How could anybody possibly like that? You know, well, I do like phonetics, but um, that gives you that. It gives you slightly more of a focus on the word itself. Okay, but we can ask our questions, our yes/no questions, equally well as a form. Sometimes, though, they sound more like a demand for information. Um, and this is, using falling intonation is much more likely in an interview situation. If you listen to broadcasts, um, if people are asking a panel for their views, for example, <coughs> they're much more likely to use falling intonation here rather than the um, sort of rather involved, uh, personal, rising patterns. Will you be staying on in London? Try that. Will you stay on in London? Okay, right, so that's just a kind of very impersonal, but perfectly polite, but impersonal way of asking that. Um, a rather more concerned and personal way would be, will you be staying on in London? Will you be staying on in London, using a rise? Um, there's a some, somehow a more personal involvement if you're using the rise, um, and a more sort of in, uh, uninvolved, but perfectly friendly uh, Suggesting if you're using the four. Have you finished your homework? Right? Good. Have they decided on a date for the election? Good, good. Okay. So, all of those perfectly, perfectly normal with a falling tone. Um, you just sound a bit more concerned and involved, perhaps, with the speaker if you used the rising intonation there. 
Sometimes, however, we use polar question format as echo questions, and then our choice of pitch is a little bit more constrained, I think. So somebody's asked me, will I be staying on in London? And I say, oh, will I be staying on in London? Will I be staying on in London? Will I be staying on in London? To signal the fact that I'm making an echo of a question that I've been asked, um, I use the rising intonation there. And rising intonation there often signals echo questions. And also in response to have they decided on the date for the, date for the election. I might echo that by saying, oh, have they decided on the date for the election? Use a full rise. Any old rise would do. Yeah. Um, but I'm signaling by that rising tone that it's an echo question. <coughs> Declarative questions are questions that have no uh, interrogative syntax in them. There's no subject verb inversion. Uh, so they look like statements. If you write them down there, um, they look like ordinary uh, declarative statements of some sort. But we often, as I'm sure you know, just simply ask our questions in this declarative way, but by using a rising intonation on that declarative question, de declarative statement, to show that it's actually a question. So I can ask you, instead of saying, are you specialising in English language, I can say something like, oh, you're specialising in English language? Yeah. Uh, if I want to ask you if you want a drink, I can say coffee. Coffee? Just invitation, yeah. Uh, rising tone, question there. Um, and that's the safest sort of tone to do if you want it to be quite clear that you are, in fact, trying to ask a question. Um, so you're probably also aware that the pattern I'm showing you there in 17 and 18, specialising in English language, um, is also the pattern that has been adopted in recent years by the younger generation um, as a kind of normal part of their um, declarative intonation when they're not actually asking questions. So the older generation get terribly sort of hot under the collar and say, why are you asking me this? Um, when in fact they're actually just simply saying something. Um, are you familiar with this? People blame the, um, the Australian soaps for having uh, influenced the English language in this way. So um, you say, oh, I met this guy and we went to the club and we did this, that and the other. And I'm not asking you about this, I'm telling you, I'm telling you a story, but I'm using this rising intonation. Very much something that the younger generation does, um, so look out for it. It's a big change in the way we use intonation. We're actually using the question intonation. Um, you can actually ask declarative questions um, just by using ordinary form as well. Um, but then you do lay yourself open to being, to the response, are you asking me or telling me? Um, so if I said something like, oh, you're specialising in English language, uh, are you asking me or telling me? Uh, it's not clear. Um, but if it's something like number 19 here, so we're expecting him tonight then, quite likely put a then on the end to indicate that, that was meant to be a question. Okay. Tag questions. Um, you may be familiar with these. The aren't they's, have they's, isn't it? That kind of um, tag. Um, they usually have a separate intonation phrase and we usually have a way of differentiating between our rises and our falls on those tags according to whether we expect confirmation of what we've said or whether we're asking a genuine question. So if I say something like number 20, these socks are yours, aren't they? Once you've left in the middle of the floor, um, I'm expecting you to agree meekly that they are and to go and pick them up. Um, and in number 21, they haven't finished yet, have they? The expected answer is, no, they haven't. I and mean, you don't have to give 
somebody the expected response. After all, um, they, their presupposition may be wrong, but the way you've fr done it, the way you've intoned it, um, the intonation choice that you've made, shows that you expect agreement. Whereas when you use a rise on the tag, that isn't so cut and dried. These socks are yours, aren't they? Not so sure. Genuine question. Um, they haven't finished yet, have they? Again, a genuine question. You're not sure. In both cases, you're asking a question, but using a fall indicates your own feelings about what the right answer should be. As using a rise is much more open-ended. We're back to this open-endedness again and is leaving it, leaving it open for the speaker to just give you whatever the response is. Um, a few inter information questions. No, no, alternative questions first. And um, those are the patterns for the tag questions. Okay, yours, aren't they? They're yours, aren't they? How do they Alternative questions. Would you like tea or coffee? We're back to lists. It's exactly the same as a list. Um, you have a sort of rising pitch or uh, a non-low pitch on the first item, and then the other option will fall to the bottom to show that you've finished. These are the alternatives that you're dealing with. Are you asking me or telling me? Um, there's two options there. You have to choose one of them. Um, as I say, the answer yes or no to these questions is not usually favoured. Um, they look as though they're yes no questions, but they're not <laughs> alternative questions. Okay. Um, so that just follows the standard patterns of open endedness and completeness. Information questions. Um, the most common way of asking information questions using WH words is to use a form in pitch. That is the, perhaps the most neutral way of doing it. What time is your flight? Or with a lower fall, what time is your flight? Um, either is possible. The high fall sounds more casual. The low fall sounds a bit more serious and strong or possibly exasperated if somebody's been faffing around and haven't got themselves ready. What time is your flight? Let's say, get going. <coughs> You can use a low rise um, to initiate a com uh, conversation politely or to sound reassuring, especially to a child. Um, using these terms to an adult can sound patronising, so beware. So if you say something like, what's the time? That's perfectly normal, actually. We often ask that question that way. What's the time? But what's your name? Now, a five-year-old in the playground who are approaching a child, yes, that sounds fine, it sounds reassuring to the child. What's your name? Um, but in an adult-to-adult -adult situation, it does sound a bit as though somebody is treating the other person as a child. So it's better to say, what's your name? Um, something like that. Why are you doing it like that? <laughs> what sorts of implications in saying it that way? Um, the implication is rather patronising that you think you know better. Um, echo questions, just like with the yes no questions, we need to use a rise to indicate that they're echoes. What time is my flight? <gasps> oh, nearly, nearly missed it. Or, how am I feeling? In response to, how are you feeling? How am I feeling? I'm feeling really ill. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you echo a question back, you will use a rise. And finally, if the nucleus shifts to the question word itself, um, it becomes a type of repeat question um, because you're now focusing specifically on the what. Right, so here's my second attempt at the um, at discourse intonation, aspects of discourse intonation. And today I'm going to concentrate on what I've called social rituals. Many social exchanges in discourse have absolutely nothing to do with the exchange of information. 
Um, and of course, we know that things like nucleus placement have an awful lot to do with um, the information and highlighting what's important and what isn't. But as far as social exchanges are concerned, um, information has got very much, very little to do with it. Um, it's what, what it has got a lot to do with is establishing and maintaining interaction with some other person. Um, and what I'm going to concentrate on today are greetings, farewells, saying please and thank you, and apologies. Um, so all these are activities are associated with semi-ritualized expressions. Sometimes the intonation we use is relatively fixed. Sometimes we have really quite a lot of leeway, um, and there's a lot of different ways that we can say things. They may have certain implications depending on how we say them. Right, let's start with greetings. The absolutely standard um, formula for greeting somebody, at least in British English, is supposed to be the word hello. Everyone say hello. Right. Now, here is a word you can say in a myriad different ways. You can say it like I've done here, um, as illustrated on the um, slide here, uh, with a high form. Hello. Do it again. Yes. And that's a perfectly normal, natural, neutral, um, semi-formal way of using the word. Um, you can also, of course, use a rise if you want. Hello. Hello. Okay. Anybody get any impression of what the difference might be between using a, um, a full hello and hello? Is there anything particular that you notice? I have to speak more loudly. Okay, with the rising we encourage further conversation. Thank you. That's exactly the point I was going to make. Using a rise is something that really focuses on establishing interaction with the other person and on continuing the conversation. Very good. Um, okay, so the fall sounds perfectly polite and friendly. Um, it doesn't particularly in, um, encourage further interaction and it doesn't discourage it, but it doesn't explicitly encourage it. It's perfectly appropriate if you're being informally introduced to somebody for the first time, um, or when there's nothing unexpected in the encounter with that other person. Um, so it's a fairly neutral way of doing it with the fall, but with a rise, there's a definite commitment being expressed to maintaining the interaction. Um, so if you use <coughs> A low rise, as in this illustration here, a low, with a high prehead. Um, that does give the impression that you're really trying to establish contact. It's also the sort of reassuring intonation which you might use to a small child. Hello. Yeah, that sort of fits in very well with a small child. They will feel reassured. And it doesn't sound too patronising with an adult, as long as you are genuinely using it in order to establish and maintain interaction. Um, so, we might have, as in um, example three on your handout, um, the first person say, hello, fancy meeting you. And the other person can then respond, oh, hello. Or, oh, hello, yes, this is a surprise. Um, there's something about it. it. There can be an element of surprise expressed by using this rise as well in meeting this other person. And we use that um, rising intonation as well when we use the word hello to mean something other than a greeting. Um, some of you may be familiar with the fact that when we're looking for something, or, when, or we, even when we're not looking for something, but we find something unexpectedly, we say, oh, hello, what's this? We're not actually addressing this object that we found in our um, in our sock drawer or something like that, and saying, um, hello, how are you? We're saying, oh, hello. Um, goodness me, we're just saying to ourselves, how surprising. So we would use a rising intonation in that particular sort of context. Hello, what's this? 
Um, and the other example I've given you, number five on the handout, that's the sort of um, stereotypical Cockney policeman in a Punch and Judy show saying, hello, 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 what's up for you? Um, so, hello, 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 it's always done with that rising intonation to express surprise at finding something. <laughs> answering the telephone. It's quite common to use a rising tone of some sort. Um, and it could be a low rise or it could be a high rise. Um, but we probably tend to use a low prehend. We pick up the phone and say hello. We pick up the phone and say hello. Hello. That would be sound more normal than say hello. Um, we might not say the word hello at all. We might say our name, Joe Smith here, or we might say the number, 7493. It's very common to use a rising tone in that situation because then it does encourage a response from the other person. Um, so we're orientating ourselves towards the other person by using that rise um, and encouraging them to respond to us. Uh, it would sound a bit... A bit um, as though you didn't really want to get the phone call if you pick it up and say hello. Uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes when one's preoccupied and one thinks it's the double blazing salesman and so on, uh, rigging, then you might just do that. But it doesn't encourage further conversation. I said we could use a low rise or a high rise, but a high rise is the most likely when we're re establishing contact after being kept on hold. Um, so if we don't get a risk, so let's start, it, yes. So if there's been a, a break in the conversation, um, again, I'll be over the phone here, um, and we re-establish contact, and then we'll say, hello, hello, to check that the other person is there. And you notice we're using something in a very high register. So we use high key. Mm -hmm. It would be a high rise if you're thinking about the individual nu nuclear tone, um, but the whole transaction would be in a very high part of our register. Hello? Hello? Um, and if we don't get a response, we then might try using the stylized calling contour, which you haven't got an official nuclear tone mark for. I've used a, a sort of step down here. It's not, sh not very clear on here, I'm afraid. It's clearer perhaps on your handout. Um, a high level on the first bit and then moving to uh, a mid-level. So it sounds like, hello, hello. Can you all do that? Hello. <laughs> hello. How many of you have got something like that in your own language? Yeah, quite a few people. How, pe how many people don't think they've ever heard anything like that in their own language? <laughs> right, okay. Um, it's quite common to have that kind of slightly stylized um, ee, 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 sort of uh, pattern. Um, and it is quite common in English. Um, it's often called the calling contour. English, hello, cooey, can you hear me? It's a kind of sing-song effect there. Uh, it's also the pattern that we use. If we for example, um, need to attract attention from a distance, or when you walk into some shop or something like that and there's nobody there and you're wondering where they are, say, hello, um, anybody there? So a stylized um, calling contour comes into play there. Now, if we're just greeting each other casually, um, we often use something like the mid-level tone with a high prehead. And this leaves us rather uncommitted as to whether we're going to carry on the conversation. So it's quite useful from that point of view. If we don't, if we want to say, I'm in a hurry, oh, hello, um, hello, <laughs> and we can just move on. And nobody's offended by the fact that you haven't stopped to have a chat. Um, if you had said, oh, hello, um, you might have expected to stay on and have a bit more of a chat. We just say, hello, hello. It's left open as to whether you can do that or not. And it's not rude then to, um, to go on elsewhere. OK, 
Okay, so lots of different ways of saying hello. Um, you could even have a full rise hello, um, which is a sort of intense version of the surprised to find it sort of contour. Um, you can practice with all sorts of different tones, and they will all have their uses. But that other familiar greeting uh, that we use, hi, that's much more restricted. Um, it's not strictly true to say that the Brits use hello and the Americans use hi. Um, the Brits use hi a lot as well. Um, so it's a very, very common greeting in Britain. Um, but we seem to be stuck with using a four on hi. Hi. If I say hi, I seem to be questioning the fact that I'm using this word. It's a, it sounds really, really strange. Um, however, having said that, I don't think it's strictly true that we never use any kind of rise because we can use something like a very high full rise on high to show a casual sort of greeting. Hi! Hi! Do you want to try that? Hi! Yeah. Again, it's going to be in high key, right up in the high part of our register. Um, but the commonest way of doing it is simply with a fall. Hi. Probably quite a wide range fall, so it probably counts as a high fall. High key. Um, if you do it with a low fall, hi, it sounds really unengaged. Um, so not terribly polite. Say hi. Uh, <laughs> means go away. I don't know. <laughs> Basically. But uh, the casual and informal way. Um, it's really uh, very common just to have that fall to a mid-level. I've illustrated that in the second part of number 11 there. Uh, oh, I'm getting behind myself here. Right, um, this one here. Hi. Hi. Oh, hi. Hi. Listen to people talk, greeting each other. You will find they often use something like that. Hi. Um, <coughs> So it again doesn't commit you to continuing the, um, the interaction if you don't want to. Um, it allows you just to say hi, hi, and carry on with what you're doing. Okay, so using a simple rise on hi really isn't an option. You don't say hi. Hi? It sounds really odd. Okay. What else can we do in order to greet people? We have some formal greeting formulae as well, like good morning, good, good afternoon, good evening, and so on. Okay. And both falls and rises are acceptable. Um, and uh, both acceptable in formal, polite situations. Again, using the rise just has that extra bit of interaction with the other person and um, that extra bit of commitment to continuing that ex interaction. Um, but you could easily have a sequence like on here, sort of, good morning, good morning. Um, sort of first one, second one, sort of completing the exchange, if you like, they're using the falling tone as a kind of completion of the interaction. Good morning, good morning. But equally well, you could get Good morning. <coughs> oh, good morning. You could have both <coughs> using the rise. Notice that the nucleus must go on morn. It's the stressed syllable of morning. Um, it's that word which is accented rather than the good. Okay. Um, we use those expressions, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, in definitely in formal situations. Um, but in casual situations, we can still use them, but we tend to drop the good. Just say, morning. Um, so, I have a high fall here, morning. Right, high rise, morning. Or that falling to mid-level, which is a bit like the um, calling contour, but perhaps not quite so stylized. Morning, morning. Again, it's using the high register. We like to do our greetings using high register. Um, a high fall is fine, even if it goes down to the baseline, because it's using the top part of our pitch range. 
Um, the high rise is fine because it's in the, in the top part of our pitch range. And morning is very much in the top of our pitch range. Um, it just doesn't sound, it sounds grumpy and unfriendly if you only use the bottom part of your range. Morning. Okay. An initial greeting is often followed by the expression, how are you? Okay. Traditionally, you get taught that the first speaker accents are, and the second speaker accents you. Now, this follows good tonicity rules. So you get, how are you? Fine, thanks. How are you? Okay. And that's the representation of it. And yes, you will still hear that. Um, we put the emphasis on the R, first of all. Um, how are you? And then we respond, I'm fine, thanks, how are you? With the emphasis on the other person. You are returning the greeting to that other person. Um, now, it would sound strange if you said, how are you? In, if, sorry, if both speakers said, how are you? Um, so, hello, how are you? I'm fine, thanks, how are you? No, no, that would be really wrong. Okay. On the other hand, you will quite often find that people simply use how are you by default. So the very first speaker can say, oh, hello, um, how are you? And the second can reply, fine, thanks, how are you? Um, so you won't necessarily get that switch between how are you and how are you. But if you do, remember that if you're the one doing the replying, you've got to use this one, how are you, and not how are you. Um, sometimes this expression is just treated more casually as a fixed formula, and it even uses a high rise sometimes. How are you? How are you? That's a very casual thing. Um, possibly you don't really want to know how they are, so you should respond more uh, formulaically as well. So fine, thanks, even if you were suffering from um, all sorts of things. Um, if you get this casual, how are you? Um, you don't necessarily um, expect the person to give you a complete list of all their elements. Um, the American version of um, this um, aspect of a greeting is very often, how are you doing? How are you doing? Um, and that can be typically pronounced with a falling tone. Um, so it could be, what I did then was relatively low, but perhaps even better would be, how are you doing? With a high fall on the doing. And of course we have formal introductory um, formulae in, in English as well. And we've got the traditional British Introductory, <coughs> shake hands and say, how do you do? Um, whereas in American English, it's more likely that you would say, pleased to meet you. Okay. Um, and in both cases, simple high fall is absolutely fine, but you will get all sorts of other things as well. How do you do? Um, quite sort of formulaic, casual int intonation there. But if you want to sound really polite, I would stick with the high fall, how do you do? Or pleased to meet you. Moving on to farewells. Polite farewells, okay? Uh, I should say formal, fairly formal polite farewells. It's often a good choice to use a high prehead and a low rise. So something like, goodbye, try that. Or good night, good day, good day is a farewell rather than a greeting, which is um, a slight surprise, I think, uh, because most languages have um, good day as their <laughs> standard greeting, or well, not most languages, a lot of languages do. And we seem to reserve good day um, for a farewell rather than as a greeting. Um, good night, of course, is a farewell. If we're meeting 
somebody in the evening, um, you will say, good evening. Um, but if we're going to bed, or they're leaving, you will say, good night. Uh, so um, you just have to know which formulae work in which contexts here. Um, now, all of those that I've just demonstrated, goodbye, good night, etc., they sound quite formal. Um, but what you need to do, what you need to avoid, is doing a really low um, fall on these things. Otherwise, it sounds like uh, a bit of a dismissal. It doesn't sound polite at all. Good day. That's it. Go. Um, you can imagine in a sort of uh, some kind of um, situation where you've been hauled up before the boss or something like that. And the boss has been giving you a telling off, um, you, um, but it's time for you to go. She might say, good day, um, and you have to slink off your tail between your legs. Um, or a low fall on good night and good riddance. Um, you know, the idea is that you want to get rid of this person um, and you will fall to the baseline. You will indicate finality, as we were looking at yesterday, by this drop to a very low pitch. And that will be, it will act as a dismissal. Um, so, as with the greetings, we quite often drop the good bit in our farewell formula, and we say goodbye or good night, um, or abbreviate it considerably. So, in these examples, um, the first one here, bye, <coughs> bye, that's the most common way, perhaps, of saying goodbye, bye. Notice that we fall, but we don't go to the bottom. We fall to a mid-level. We're still using the top part of the range. <coughs> so if I said bye, that would sound really a bit over the top, wouldn't it? It sounds rather like final. Bye. And the abbreviated good night would be good night. Good night. And that fits in with see ya. Yeah, that kind of thing. There's so many different ways that we can say bye. Um, and so many different expressions, they all have different amount of, um, they're all differently in fashion at any given moment. See ya, good night. It's a casual norm, I think, these particular formulas. And of course, there are other expressions. As I said, cheers is often used. Um, it means both goodbye and thank you. Don't ask me why. Um, it's just a multi-purpose word. Um, so people would, who use it would say cheers. They just simply use a simple form there. Quite a shallow, a shallow form. Right. So, so much for greetings and farewells. Now what about please and thank you? Right. When please is a tag as a marker of a polite request, when it comes at the end of the phrase, it normally takes a low rise. So something like, yes, please. Could you send it, please? Okay. I've shown it here as if it's in a separate word group all by itself. Um, there are other ways of analysing that which say that actually you can have a fall and a rise in the same word group, maybe it's a fall rise, but the fact that please so regularly occurs on its own at the end of a um, sentence um, suggests that it is actually a separate little word group tacked on, taking a low rise. But it can also be tacked onto a word group as part of the tale, which gives it a more routine character. So if I say something like, quiet, please. I don't use any pitch movement on the please, so I'm not accenting it. I'm just simply allowing it to act as part of the low-level tail following the high fall. Quiet, please. Or, a kilo of pears, please. Or, could you send it, please? That last one, I've used a 
rising nuclear tone here, so my please um, carries on that rising tail and is set at relatively high pitch. But there's no particular pitch movement, in, there's no independent pitch movement associated with it. It's simply part of the tail. So you have those two options. You can either use the low rise um, following your um, request, a kilo of pairs, please, or you can make it sound more routine, in which case you simply tack it on as part of the tail. Kilo of pairs, please. That's probably the most common in those routine situations. When the word please is initial, the beginning of your request, or it's inserted inside a clause, as it were, rather than it being tacked on at the end, or stuck at the beginning, then it normally gets incorporated into the intonation head. So, in the first example here, it would be the onset of the head. Please could you tell me the way to use the station or whatever it is you're asking. Please could you tell me, it would be accented, probably, and um, you know, relatively high in pitch as the onset of the head. Um, but it might be inserted in a non-initial position here, so in a request like, could you please move up a little bit? Could you please move me in there? That kind of thing, when you get into those lifts at the tube at Russell Square and people won't make space for you. <laughs> you often hear people make this particular request. Could you please move up at the front? Um, again, you will get the please with an accent but incorporated into the intonation head. Now, we saw what could happen, or we saw how please takes its own intonation phrase when we give it a low rise, when it's tacked on at the end of a request. Um, but if we give it uh, its own intonation phrase and pronounce it with a fall, it has a very different impression. So if I say something like, quiet, please, um, I'm emphasizing the fact that I really want you to do what the request is. The request is more of a command here, quiet, please. It sounds urgent. Okay, so the main request is please be quiet, but quiet, please. Or I need your cooperation, please. You can imagine a school teacher sometimes with some unruly children having to deal with this sort of situation. Um, you can imagine that she might have started off, if she's a little bit um, naive, so we're saying, um, quiet please. Nothing happens. <laughs> um, so uh, then she will switch to, quiet, please. And then when she gets really desperate, she'll move on to the next one. Quiet, please. <laughs> um, where it becomes more of an entreaty. A bit of pleading comes in here. So, when you use please with a full rise, please, it really takes on a lot of strength as an entreaty, as a plea. Um, it really sort of reinforces the sense of please. And that pattern, please, um, it mirrors um, it mirrors the expression something like, do take care when you're really, really, really concerned about somebody and you really want to um, emphasize your message to them. So very often we have please do something, please be careful. Um, and with that full rise pattern over the whole phrase, um, it becomes quite a strong entreaty. Please, please be careful, do take care. So again, various things you can do with please, depending on how routine the situation is and exactly um, how strong a plea you are trying to make, whether it's just a polite part of your request, or whether um, it is actually something more like a command. What about thank you? A sincere thank you. Um, a high fall is a good choice here. Um, so you would say,
say something like, thank you. Yeah. Okay? Your thank would be quite high pitched, your you quite low pitched. And that would sound sincere, genuine, thank you. Um, notice also that uh, if you're into this situation of mutually thanking each other, which we often get ourselves into, um, the first person says, uh, thank you, and then the second person says, no, no, thank you, and you know, you're trying to be polite. And so tonicity changes. It's a bit like the how are you, how are you situation. Um, we've said thank you once, um, then you want to thank the person back, as it were, thank you. Uh, you're emphasizing that it's the other person that, you, that needs to be thanked. Um, in a routine situation, and what I mean by a routine situation is when perhaps you're just getting the change in the shop from uh, the till, or you're being, being given a ticket at the railway station, um, something like that, then you can use a different sort of pattern. You can use something like the high rise, thank you. Um, you can even use the abbreviated form, which for some unknown reason has dropped the, the main word, the thank, and just says cue, cue, cue. Um, so you'll you're quite often hear that if somebody's doing a succession of thank yous and they're collecting bits of change from different people or something like that. Cue, cue. Um, or thank you, thank you. That sort of casual dee dee, um, fall to a mid level. They're all quite for, um, straightforward and all completely appropriate in a casual routine situation. However, if somebody has just um, lent you £10,000 or has just carried your heavy suitcase um, up a large flight of stairs um, and then you turn around and say, you, <laughs> they would be justified in feeling a bit miffed. I think, because it sounds as though what they have done for you is just a routine activity, whereas actually lending somebody 10,000 quid is uh, quite a significant thing to do, so you want to thank them somewhat more um, sincerely. So please be careful in such a situation. Always use the polite high fall. Thank you. Thank you so much. You can add all sorts of other bits to it, but that um, thanking using a wide range and the fully contour is appropriate. Of course, thank you or thanks can also be a tag that you put on the end of things. Um, and then it behaves a bit like please. Um, so, no thanks. Um, have a set, oops, sorry, uh, a separate word group with a low rise. Um, in a more routine situation, you could just have that as the uh, intonation tail as well, no thanks. Um, or I won't, thank you. I won't, thank you. So, just slightly different degree of routine as to whether you use the rise or just the level tail there. Um, but, be careful of the expression, no thank you. Um, so, quite distinct from thank you, uh, which is a sincere thank you, if it's no thank you, it's a refusal, of course, and it's a very strong refusal if you say it like that. Okay. Um, so no thanks or no thank you is just a polite refusal, but no thank you is when somebody's been pestering you for ages and um, won't take no for an answer. Then you can adopt this one. No thank you. A strong refusal. Or indeed a firm dismissal. Okay. How about apologies? Now, if you want to make a sincere apology, the word sorry, which is the sort of formula word for apologising, is actually rarely used on its own. It's usually incorporated into some longer expression or replaced by a longer expression. And we could um, very often use a full rise. So, for example, this first example, First one here. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, now that sounds perfectly good as a sincere apology. Um, another expression might be, oh, I do apologize. I'm using that rise at the end. Um, the 
the fall seems to indicate the sincerity and the rise at the end to sort of address the other person very um, explicitly. Um, I do beg your pardon. It's another possibility for apologising. Um, we'll then put the nucleus on whatever the intensifier is in the expression. Like here, it was the so. Um, you wouldn't say I'm so sorry. That sounds strange. It sounds as though we're sort of considering our position and I'm, I'm so sorry, but I'm in, in contrast with something else. It sounds a little odd. The nucleus will fall on the intensifier. And the intensifier is this sort of um, little word do here. I do apologise. Um, it's brought in simply to act as an intensifier and to carry that nuclear tone. Um, doesn't really serve any other purpose at all. Um, now, if we use sorry on its own, um, it's a trivial sort of apology. It's a bit like a thank you, thank you, um, but sorry, or sorry, something like that. Uh, if you tread on somebody's toe um, and you haven't really hurt them very badly, um, or you've just bumped into them a little bit, or something, you sound something fairly trivial, then um, sorry on its own is fine. But uh, beware of using it in a situation on its own uh, where a sincere apology is needed. Um, I've said here, in British English, excuse me is mainly used for attracting attention. Of course, in American English, excuse me is a very common expression for... Um, Apology when you bump into someone or something, uh, or excuse me, um, that's much more common, I think, than saying, oh, sorry. Uh, but in British English, we certainly have this expression, excuse me, we tend to use it mostly for attracting attention. So if you want to find the way and you want to ask, stop a stranger and ask the way to the station, excuse me, um, you will normally do it with that sort of intonation. Um, so the nucleus will fall on the second syllable, the excuse. And it's very common to use the full rise there to attract the attention. Um, but the commonest use of the word sorry, I would suggest, is actually not as an apology at all, um, but it's simply to request a, re a repetition. Um, the word pardon has become rather unfashionable. Um, sort of um, as the, the word to use to request a, uh, a, a repetition. We're much more likely to use the word sorry. Sorry? Didn't quite catch that. Sorry? Could you repeat that? Um, sorry, what was that? So, it's, if you use it on its own, it will then take a high rise. Uh, and if you use it as part of another expression, it may well be completely unaccented. It's just... Uh, it's often very indistinctly pronounced altogether. Sorry, sorry, what was that? Sorry, <laughs> you have to know that it's the word sorry because you wouldn't hear it. Otherwise. But it's, uh, as I say, it's not an apology at all. Then it's just a, a request for repetition. Using a fall in apologies, sorry, uh, excuse me, can sound rather hostile and possibly a little bit aggressive um, and may actually be designed to elicit an apology from the person you're talking to. So in other words, you're not feeling sorry at all. You think the other person ought to be sorry. Um, so you go to the theatre and somebody's sitting in your seat. Excuse me. Um, I think that was my seat. He turns around and says, excuse me. Shifting the nucleus as well. It was nothing of the kind. Uh, but then you retaliate. I'm sorry, that's just not good enough. Okay. It sounds a bit hostile, a bit aggressive. Hopefully you wouldn't actually in the theatre. You go instantly into this rather um, aggressive uh, way of saying things. But um, it can sound somewhat confrontational, so uh, beware using the, the high four there. Now, I'm wondering what sort of generalisations we can make here. Um, these are all a bit speculative. 
Um, but let's, let's see how far they were. In casual, routine encounters, we've got, the we've got the possibility of using tunes like the stylized calling contour. Hello, hi. Or the fall to mid-level. Sometimes they're just variants of each other, those two. Um, and usually those are normal and acceptable. Uh, that means that the whole exchange will then be in a high register or high key. Now this works quite well when we look at the um, situation for greetings and farewells, for thank you, and for trivial apologies, casual and routine. It doesn't really work for please. We don't really have please. Um, we do, and that sounds sort of facetious. It doesn't really sound um, like a routine situation at all. So it doesn't completely work. And in other situations which are not casual and routine, um, there's often a choice between a fall to low and some sort of rise. In the case of farewells, a fall to low sounds dismissive or even hostile. Um, we like to express friendly farewells, whether they're formal or casual, so that they end on a mid-level pitch. I find that a sort of fascinating thing because it's as if somehow it's unfriendly to put a completion sort of intonation onto a farewell. Um, you know, apart from this sort of, you know, strong dismissal. We want to leave things open, leave, leave things open-ended with our farewells. We say bye, love and bye. Um, I don't know, that's just speculation on my part. Okay. Other things that people have said in terms of interpretation, and um, I just leave you with the ideas to think about. Um, is there an association between a fall to low, to low pitch, and dominance, speaker dominance, um, which has sometimes been proposed? Um, or is there some sort of association between rising pitch and being deferential? Um, it's, it's often been said, oh, men use more falls and women use more rises, which is a load of rubbish, actually. But um, <laughs> historically, this is meant to be sort of that, um, you know, women are more deferential and men are more aggressive, uh, sort of, uh, what's the word, dominant. Um, but there may be some truth in it in certain exchanges, and it's worth listening to how people use falls and rises, just to see. Um, but if we do interpret things that way, it means there must be some kind of status inequality between the speaker and the hearer. But it's worth <coughs> thinking about. Um, and another thing that people have sometimes said is just, does this distinction make better sense in terms of the orientation of the speaker? Um, so using a fall might imply that um, you are orienting what you are saying to yourself and to your own position. Whereas if you use a rise, you're more likely to be orienting yourself towards your listener. Oh, well, again, that works up to a point, but not completely. It works very well for greetings, for farewells. Um, certainly a lot here are oriented to use this farewell with a, a uh, low fall, for example. It works reasonably well for pleas and apologies. Um, it can arguably apply to thank you too, but um, I, I do wonder because thanking, thanking somebody should be hearer oriented, and yet this fall to low is what we expect as the polite version of it. So it's always very hard to make real generalizations and watertight um, interpretations of these things, but I hope that. Um, Given you a few ideas to be going on with, at least, and a few ideas for how you can use these rituals as you go around your business in English. Thank you.